gentlemen, please welcome Chief Executive Officer Mike Gregoire. Wow. Good morning. What an extraordinary group. The companies represented here, the diverse industries, the spectrum of technology backgrounds, truly something. But we all have something in common. All of us, myself included, have traveled to see a world to improve our ability to deal with a rapidly changing business environment. And we're so glad you're here. Welcome. You know, this is the tip of the spear, the tip of the spear of transformation. We have long passed the point where enterprise software is merely used to drive efficiencies. The focus now is clearly on accelerating business value, and that's our number one priority. Today, I want to talk about the crossroads of creativity and execution. We call them pivot moments. We're going to talk about people and organizations who made those pivots. I want to stretch your imagination, get you to think beyond technology. Some examples will come from the world of business, while others will come from some unexpected places, like a town teetering on the brink of extinction, or extreme athletes hanging on the edge of a cliff. Our goal is to use our wits, imagination, and abilities to foresee a different path, to figure out how to take that path. At CA, we have plotted a path and have transformed our business into an agile DevSecOps environment, which helps drive maximum digital impact. And this transformation is available to all of you. So let's start way outside of our industry and take a look at a successful pivot made by a small town. 30 years ago, Leadville, Colorado was a fading mining outpost. But then a miner and local politician, Ken Kluber, came along. He loved marathons, triathlons, extreme sports, and he had a vision. And when he fueled that vision with digital, he changed the trajectory of Leadville remaking the town as a destination for adventure sports like the Leadville 100, the most difficult mountain bike race in North America. In 1994, the first Leadville 100 uh, had 150 cyclists. Now, they have to limit it to 2,000. Pros and amateurs alike receive no special treatment. It's a true democracy based on previous race performance and a lottery. 2010, Ken sold uh, the Leadville 100 to Lifetime Fitness, a high end of fitness centers. Lifetime brought in Strava, a digital partner, who are here with us today. Strava is an app that lets runners, cyclists, and triathletes share detailed information about their training and results. With that partnership, the race exploded. Through this social media site, it made it more fun. It gave athletes insights to shape their training and the race strategy. Leadville took a chance on somebody's weird and wonderful vision, and they came out on top because they embraced change. Now, racing Leadville is a bucket list item for all top endurance athletes. What Leadville did is pretty remarkable, and it's counterintuitive. Change is not natural for all of us. In fact, a number of scientific studies have concluded that on the whole, the average human, chimpanzee, and squirrel is more conservative than he or she needs to be. I don't know what to think about that. <laughs> but the studies have also noted that with each species, there's a small outlier group who demonstrates less fear and who even prefers Choices with more risk. I believe change in your companies will be driven by you, the technologists, the ones who are not afraid to take that risk. 
Now, I'm not saying we should all, you know, have an insatiable appetite for risk. I'm simply saying that we need to do a better job of managing risk, not avoiding it. So here's what I'm talking about. I'm convinced that every one of you in the audience here knows how to make your business better. But something holds you back. Your idea will probably cause friction. But that idea could be all the difference in the world to unlock revenue and grow your business. Playing it safe can actually be the most risky decision you can make. Part of CA's promise to our customers is helping them get the risk profile right. The right choices can position you to take advantage of new business models, new markets, better security techniques, and greater customer intimacy. In the increasing digital world of business, we have to develop a new sense of digital intuition. We need to cultivate a deep understanding of where the data is coming from, what it means, and how to use it responsibly. To offer an example, Optum, the digital arm of United Healthcare, possesses the most healthcare data in the industry, derived from hundreds of millions of claims. Here's the pivot. Optum is changing and now leveraging the data to enhance the user experience. Exactly what you'd see from tech giants like Google and Facebook that mastered this for consumers. This is a great example of the future. More and more enterprise class products are using data to enhance user experiences, just like consumer applications. Optum is using a suite of CA solutions, including Agile Central, Project and Portfolio Management, API Management, Service Virtualization, and BlazeMeter to harness and synthesize their data. Now, doctors and patients can make better decisions about healthcare, whether it is identifying diseases, addressing gaps in care, managing costs. Every industry is trying to solve specific challenges. Take retail. We all know that online shopping is affecting brick and mortar retailers. But the smart, traditional retailers, retailers are harnessing technology to bring the best of both worlds together. Home Depot is a great example. They've embraced software to ensure the shopping experience is customized as quickly as possible. Home Depot is using CA's API management and single sign-on products to make sure that when customers have a question, their associates have near instant access to the answers and information they need. They're always positioned to help finalize the sale. Customer service and customer experience mean everything to Home Depot. Being able to provide customers with what they need right when they need it is helping drive their success by making digital work for them. So, there is still a future for brick and mortar retailing. And further proof, Amazon is building retail stores. When the ultimate brick and mortar disruptor decides to get into brick and mortar, we know it's going to be an omni-channel play to get customers to buy. Success is not a single lane. You need to compete across multiple dimensions. Experience and data combine to reveal the bigger picture. There's no substitute for mining the data, connecting the dots, and executing. Another great example of listening to the data and changing from within is City Fintech essentially a full-blown tech company that lives inside City. City FinTech pursues the ultimate user experience, experience driven by data. Yo Piazza, a 30-year City veteran who is now CEO of City FinTech, has embraced the tech ethos of fail fast or learn fast to encourage her people to not be afraid of trying new things. We're proud that City Fintech uses Agile Requirement Designer to help accelerate time to market and reduce delays in project delivery through faster testing. Part of uh, what they're doing is through their API strategy, which has enabled the company to quickly connect with developers via application programming interfaces, but no one can tell this story better than Yo herself.
City FinTech was established about two years ago, and it was really designed to come in and test boundaries and think about things differently and really see what it would take to be able to move to become a more agile organization. Agility is critical. We really wanted to be able to set up a test and learn type of environment. So it starts with how we co-create with our customer, how we engage our product design and engineers collectively to make sure that we can put our solutions in market at speed. We couldn't use a traditional testing model. So we actually engaged with CA and uh, used their ARD tool to really think about testing differently, so to be able to get through um, an increased cycle time. And it's made a big difference for us. And now it's actually being deployed throughout city as a whole. We actually built out a brand new set of product for our um, City Gold customers, and we did that in eight months, which would have normally taken three to five years under normal waterfall estimation. The ability to change how we interact, to think about things differently in much shorter cycles because the customer's appetite for change is growing exponentially. And they're going to constantly want best-in-class experiences and best-in-class services. And if we don't have the ability to run at speed, we're going to get left behind. I would just like to thank CA. We were truly honored when I got the call around the opportunity to be part of Mike's keynote. I think it's a great recognition of what we're trying to do in the industry, and it's great to see strong partners recognize us for that. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, City Fintech, and thank you, Yo. What a, what a great story. At CA, we too have been on a deliberate journey of digital transformation for years. We have embraced open source. We serve public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid data centers. We've adopted transparent, transparent pricing on our website. Our sales professionals are not negotiators, but product consultants. We actually have developers that actually meet with customers. What's behind all this? Our CTO, Otto Berkus, wrote a book, Digitally Remastered. It's the blueprint for what we call the modern software factory. It frames how organizations transform themselves by leveraging agile, automation, insights, and security. But the benefits of the modern software factory are not limited to just business. Let's talk about another pivot, a pivot that enhanced the relationship between government and citizens. In Singapore, they were trying to solve a vexing problem. People were calling the police department for everything. A loud construction project, broken water pipe, a dangerous intersection, everything. Enter a new way of thinking by Singapore's government technology agency. They faced a tangle of 11,000 data sets. Instead of trying to migrate all of that into one system, they had a better idea build a single engagement layer across all of these disparate agencies for one-stop shopping. And that's what they did using API gateway technology. Today, 5.7 million people of Singapore can access any department of government using the OneService app. Another example, using our Veracode technology, working with the state of Missouri to help the personal data Missouri, uh, for Missouri's 6 million citizens. Application security testing became a significant focus for the state's cybersecurity initiative. And using Veracode's cloud-based service, now Missouri proactively reduces risk in more than 360 applications across 14 different agencies. Here's a pivot we all can relate to. We all know the Netflix story. They move from mail to digital to content creator. Could they have even imagined 10 years ago that Netflix would be chowing down a third of the internet's bandwidth during primetime hours? What's their secret? It's the spooky, accurate recommendation engine that keeps you addicted. It's the most powerful part of the Netflix experience. And this is propelled by our atomic workload automation solution. It enables 100 plus Netflix data, Netflix data scientists to drive improvements and constant innovation. Provide self-service capabilities to enable Netflix staff to run processes against specific data sources. And abstracts a ton of complexity 
with a modern user interface. It doesn't matter how big your company is, how much market share it has, how much funding you've raised. If I know one thing about the tech industry, it's this. There is no such thing as too big to fail. To stay viable, the best run firms in tech are always chasing the next wave. That can make for some difficult decisions about whether to adopt new solutions or business models. To innovate successfully, you have to set creativity free. The truly innovative people I have met have an insatiable desire to follow what interests them. One of them is Jimmy Chin, world famous mountaineer, skier, director, and photographer. Jimmy possessed a mindset that allowed him to envision what he wanted to do, and then he just had to figure out how to go do it. And this he has made his life's work. No one gave Jimmy the assignment to go climb the impossible Mount Maru. He wanted to do it. And along the way, he was creative enough and smart enough to capture the process on film and produce an award-winning, top-grossing documentary in 2015. After I watched this movie and I thought about the context of business, it immediately dawned on me that this is an extreme example of balancing creativity and execution. And that's the goal. In summing, uh, summiting Maru, Jimmy and his team of three climbers, they did not hold a committee meeting to discuss the best options, and they make a series of compromises to arrive at a consensus. Jimmy saw the way forward, and he just went. Now, Obviously, that's not the way every business process can work. But it certainly holds true for creativity. I think we can all agree that there is no such thing as an innovation committee. And you should always be open-minded about where the next big breakthrough might come from. That's one reason why CA created our accelerator program, an in-house innovation engine. We wanted to help our people gestate the next big idea. We set up a Lean Canvas template and encouraged every team member to sketch out their flashes of inspiration in the form of a short business pro uh, proposal. No bureaucracy, no friction. Our accelerator uses a proven venture capital funding model right inside CA. And we supply the reach, operational ability, and convert thought to actua actuality. Otto spent some time at last year's CA World on a particular uh, accelerator incubation, Waffle.io, which automates workflows in GitHub. Adoption is everything in the digital world, and we're seeing great results. 145,000 users, and its revenue has grown 500% in the last six months. The ability to move from inspiration all the way to delivery is the secret ingredient to success. And we want to turn this accelerator loose on an important part of all of our lives, government. I'm super excited to announce brand new, the brand new CA Smart Government Challenge today. CA in, in, has inspired a competition where the best idea to improve citizen experience will receive technical and business support and a $100,000 grant from our accelerator program. The details for this are out today, and I encourage all of you to check it out. Innovation comes from desire, collaboration, taking risks, things that you will not find in a two-inch thick user manual. Most everyone in our industry is operationally efficient. But operational efficiency on its own is not the mother of invention. It's balancing execution and creativity that leads to success. An amazing example of getting it right happened this past uh, June at Yosemite National Park. Alex Honold free soloed nearly 3,000 feet up El Capitan one of the most famous and perilous granite walls in the world. Free solo, it means exactly what you think it means. No ropes, 
no net, no kidding. Now, of course, not everyone embraces the level of execution risk where failure has ultimate consequences. But I can tell you one common trait of those that have a track record of success is how they react when things go wrong. The historian Bernard Lewis hit the nail on the head when he summarized the two basic ways people and nations respond to adversity and decline. The winners, he observed, are the people, when they hit the wall, ask a simple question. What did we do wrong? Which leads to a second question. How do we make it right? The rest, they're the people that can only think of one question. Who did this to us? The winners are capable of sifting through the data, identifying the variables that are most critical, and then putting the pieces together in a new way. So, let's look at a legendary entrepreneur who did just that, Fred Smith. Fred came up with the, a brilliant idea that defines putting the pieces together in a new way. Fred, of course, is the founder of FedEx, and he famously wrote a term paper that addressed the logistical challenges and requirements companies face in the age of IT. Fred's pivot was realizing that he wanted to be in the global logistics business, not the package delivery business. And as he grew that, that idea, data security became an increasingly dominant component to current and future success. To keep trust of their customers, he had to modernize the security infrastructure. CA works with FedEx on preventing security breaches of their data and critical systems. For FedEx, it's all about keeping the bad guys out. But for another client of ours, it's about catching the bad guys. The FBI uses our application performance management software to optimize the next generation identification system. This system provides biometric matching for fingerprints, palm prints, retina scans for 25,000 local law enforcement agencies and on a record high day processed 700,000 matching requests. CA is very proud to support a mission critical system like this you know, just, just think of what's at stake. For us, it's exciting to see the modern software factory finding a home in government agencies. So, let's head north to my home country, look at the great city of Montreal. Montreal has a public transit system, and their authority is working on an interesting project. Using API gateways, they created an intelligent bus that uses GPS to pinpoint the exact locations of the fleet. So if you're standing on a corner waiting for the bus, you can go to your phone and you can see whether the bus is going to be there in 30 seconds or three minutes. This is government delivering an Uber-like experience. This is the impact enterprise applications can have on customer experiences. Software is the creative medium of our age. In fact, writing great software and the act of digitizing processes is legally considered a form of art. And we've seen it change the world and be changed by it. Both Eudora for email and Netscape for browsing did that. The initial impact was revolutionary, and they were adored. But the world continued to change and pass them by. End of success, end of story. It's not good enough to be good or even great. True value comes from being willing and able to change. Eurosport, for example, the number one sports media platform in Europe, despite their success, Eurosport continued to push. They were convinced that the future would be digital. And they knew they needed to bring digital to their viewers as close as possible to the action as they could. At CA, we couldn't agree more. We worked with them this last year to launch a new second screen app experience for their professional cycling fans. 
our API, API management and app experience and analytic tools now enable Eurosport to efficiently deliver real-time data to all their viewers across all of their devices. Take a look at the pivot point powered by CA. Eurosport is the home of cycling, so we are always looking for new, innovative ways to enhance our live cycling coverage. Our goal with CA is to build something unique, and innovation means technical challenges, so working with a major software company definitely makes sense. In one hand, you have Eurosport, and the other one, you have the technologists providing the right tools and experts, and in the middle, you have this, this magical uh, Brand new experience for the users, you know, with a live feed data flowing in any cycling event. It's, it's truly amazing. This partnership is for broadcast and digital. For Eurosport, it's the ability to deliver data with more speed, more efficiency, and in real time for all our viewers on all our devices. So I would say that our cooperation is the way of using our tools in interaction with a live sport event uh, to bring numbers about the emo emotions of the actors. Uh, the users have the possibility to check the status of their riders to get closer to the race, get a closer feeling. The systems provided by CA Technologies allow us to take cycling fans closer to the peloton than ever before. We're really proud of it and we're happy to see how many people love it. Another great story. This is the kind of second screen experience that every sport is soon going to have. It is a complex world there for business decision makers. There are very few obvious answers for when and how we should pivot. You need to have the right vision. You need to be a good listener. You have to know when to follow your gut and when to rein yourself in. You have to be persistent and thoughtful, cast aside convention, and execute thoroughly with determination. And you have to recognize today you are competing on code. Now that all sounds like a pretty tall order. But everyone in this room possesses the tools to face the challenges they confront each and every day. First among their, those tools is your modern software factory. Your factory ensures that your company is built to change and can adapt to an accelerating digital world. Building your own modern software factory is now a prerequisite for staying competitive. No doubt, digital transformation is a heavy lift. But the potential benefits are tremendous. We're talking about a government agency or one of your companies building a modern software factory is playing the long game. We must not be seduced by any particular moment of success. Our focus must stay on the bigger picture long-term sustainable growth. Equally important is picking the right friends and assembling the right tools. With more than 40 years in technology, we bring the experience and solutions to help chart your own path. We provide what you need to build your own modern software factory. Our purpose is to be the engine, the architect, and the model. Lean on us. Corner our experts, challenge us. We have more than 170 customers speaking here. Talk to them. I think you'll be delighted at what you discover when you go deep. And we are here to help. Your success is the ultimate measure of our success. And that fuels us. Let's win together. Thank you. When I think about CA World every year, I really take a great deal of responsibility giving back to our customer community. And I want to challenge them. I want to get them to think about things that they otherwise wouldn't think about. My name is Jimmy Chin, and I am a photographer, filmmaker, and a professional climber and skier. In my field of work, you have to be extremely calculated or things can go terribly wrong. 
I think our industry over-indexes on creativity at the expense of execution. It's really about preparation. It's really about knowledge, experience, patience, taking your time. I was taking a look at some of the work that Jimmy does, and I see how creative you have to be in making real-time decisions. At the same time, you had better make sure your execution is flawless. And seeing those two things tied together, I thought was an interesting metaphor that we could bring to CA World, but how you do it requires something more than just a speech. And if you want to make it authentic, you have to put the effort in and you have to seek to understand before you can seek to be understood. Jimmy, I'm Mike. Hey, Mike. Good to meet you. Oh, yeah. How are you? Good to meet you as well. So the best way to get to know Jimmy is to go into his backyard and live in his environment, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I just felt like Mike might be the type of guy that would like a challenge. So uh, how much climbing experience do you have? I live in a two-story house. Yeah. So there's stairs to get up to my bedroom. <laughs> so my plan with Mike are really to take him out and uh, give him a chance to put his hands to stone. When I got to the rock, I was introduced to something called dead vertical climbing, which, of course, I've never done before. Flip my rope to it. This is going to be something else. He's going to love this. I'm ready to give this a shot. Go ahead and climb. OK, climbing. You really have to be thinking through how you're going to make this work, how you're going to make decisions um, in real time. You have to evaluate the risks and the consequences of something not working. But if you have an accurate sense of that risk, then you know the, the focus really gets on the execution. I can't say I'm loving this right now. Oh, well, Mike seems to be having a pretty good time. You, you're thinking one or two moves ahead. You know, if I put my hand here and my foot here, and I do that, I mean, I have to be thinking about what's going to happen after that. Grand ballet, Mike. I'm really struggling, Jimmy, to find a foothold. I was definitely frustrated when I'm when I'm standing there and I just can't figure it out. Remember, use your feet. He knew that if we climbed this rock, there'd be a moment there where I had to go figure it out on my own. <sighs> Another unconventional move. We're happy when I'm 100 feet higher. And, uh, you know, I appreciated the lesson. You have to commit. There's no other way. You're hanging on a cliff, <laughs> and you got to find a way to make it happen. I'm all good. Woo! You got to pull that. One more. Well done. Good that was job. something else. So I got you, uh, got you out of your comfort zone. Impossible challenge piled on top of another. Sounds familiar, right? And the similarities continue. Long and unscheduled hours, finding art in life and in work, the struggle for work-life balance, ensuring flawless execution, kind of made me think. Here's an entrepreneur that might have an interesting perspective on our world. So one day I called him up. The more we talked, the more parallels I saw. Success for him and for us begins with creativity. Having a unique vision to do something that's never been done before. Then comes the cold calculus required to execute that vision, all while embracing agility to adapt conditions that change. And as for failure, that's not an option for, for us or for him. So, before you meet Jimmy, just let me tell you a little bit about what he's accomplished, the classic underachiever. Three epic first ski descents, including Mount Everest. Just think about that for a second. <laughs> Twelve uh, ski descents of the Grand Teton. Climbed uh, Mount Everest two times. 15 one-day ascents of El Capitan, and his most famous climb became the award-winning uh, documentary, Maru. Now, I need, I need your help here. This is, you know, extremely accomplished gentleman left me hanging on a cliff and scared the daylights out of me. And as much as I'm tempted to give him a, a real hard time, because this is not exactly his environment. He lives in the outdoors, and this environment's a little bit different, but... Instead of uh, repaying them, 
Let's give him a super warm, welcoming applause and bring him on out here. Come on, Jimmy. Let's have a seat. So I've, I've got a, a bunch of questions here that I've been working on to help us drive through and understand creativity, execution, risk, collaboration, all the things that we have to do to get our jobs right, and we get to see a different perspective of other people that have to, to do the similar things. Maybe the risk profile is a, a little bit different. Um, but I think it might be an interesting way for us to really drive home some of these lessons that we learn each and every day, but to reinforce them and maybe take a different perspective. But I'm going to warm you up with a few softballs and help everybody here get to know you a little bit better. Great. So, I'm ready. in high school, we're going to go back to high school. Oh, yeah. You attended a very prestigious prep school, um, Shattuck St. Mary's. A lot of famous alumni. Are you the most famous alumni from Shattuck? <laughs> no. That is correct. It would be <laughs> Sidney Crosby. Do you have a picture of Sidney? Sidney Crosby. For those hockey fans. Yeah. <laughs> so Shattuck is, is a great school, and it's a, it's a very interesting school because it's filled with world-class athletes. They primary fo primarily focus on hockey. They have 15 current NHL players uh, in, in the league right now, and they've had 50 pros come <clears> through Shattuck. It's very well-respected academic school, great sports school, tons of Olympic athletes. You are, by the way, the most famous climber. Sure. So you got that going for you. I know, the most famous. And my son is playing uh, Shattuck on February 17th, so I'm going to right. try and make that game. So you go to this great school that really you know, reinforces athletics and intellect. And then you go to another very prestigious, elite, hard to get into school, Carleton College, and you study Asian studies. And as a father that's putting two kids through college, and I think many of you probably relate to that as well, give us a little bit of a feel after your parents focus on your education and get you into some of the best schools in the country and you say, you know what, I'm going to take my diploma, I'm going to go live in my car for a couple years and go climb some rocks. How'd that go down? Oh, that went down great. <laughs> I mean, my, my parents are, uh, you know, Chinese immigrants, kind of stereotypical of that, you know, ethos of really pushing me academically in, in all these different ways. And, and a big focus was academics and... Uh, you know, as far as I knew growing up, you could be a lawyer, a doctor, or a, an executive in finance, Be right? careful about the executive. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so when I decided to move into my car, um, I, I told him, I was like, look, I'm just going to take one year off, and I'm going to climb and ski full time, and I'm going to get out of my system, and I'm going to pursue a real career. Well, one year turned into two, two turned into three, and I ended up living out of my car for seven years. But I was climbing full time um, and skiing and doing odd jobs to kind of support it. But I would call my sister and be like, hey, how are mom and dad doing? And, and she'd say, mom just keeps saying, I've raised a homeless man. <laughs> um, so you can imagine uh, it, it, it didn't go over that well in the beginning. So how did, you know, this is a lot about self-awareness, and I always found you've got a very advanced view of self-awareness, but this happened at a relatively early age, because I mean, at the end of the day, I think most of us don't like to disappoint, you know, in general, you definitely don't like to disappoint your parents, and the future's uncertain, you take a, a very, you know, linear course, and you, you kind of play it safe. You decided really early on that that was not going to be your path. How, how did you come to that conclusion? I don't know. I mean, I know probably somewhere in my early 20s, uh, I, I don't know, I just felt the sense of urgency in life. Like it was 
going to be too, it's too short to like do something I wasn't deeply passionate about. And I don't know where that came from. Uh, probably a few different intersections of experiences where I, I just knew that I didn't want to live like a normal life or at least not the life that, you know, was laid out in front of me and someone said, this is how you have to live. Um, and then I found climbing and climbing was all about taking risks, but being smart about it and pushing yourself. And it's kind of a constant exercise of being outside of your comfort zone because to get better as a climber, you're, you always are pushing yourself to do things that aren't that comfortable. Um, and that kind of almost became the ethos for how I saw the world. Well, that's, uh, that's quite, a, quite a journey. There's a, if you go to on YouTube, Robert De Niro has, um, does his commencement address to NYU, their school of theater. And the first thing he, he says to him is, he uses some profanity, basically, that you're all screwed. And the only thing you got going for you is that you're chasing your life's dream. And as long as you hang on to that, you're going to be okay. So I was thinking about you and what you just said, and I was thinking about what Robert De Niro just told this graduating class that had their whole future out ahead of them. And I think it's a pretty powerful message. So let me take us to your backyard, Jackson Hole. Sure. So Jimmy's a dual resident, New York City, Jackson Hole, moves back and forth between the two. I think he likes Jackson Hole better than New York City. Is that true? A little yes. bit? Yes. <laughs> All right, so you invited me to come hang with you in Jackson Hole, <laughs> and you led me up the side of a vertical rock face. Now, I, I knew nothing about climbing, as you probably saw from the video. And there's a ranking system. I guess the hardest is 15, uh, 5.15. That's the hardest? Yes, 5.15. And so I was expecting this to be, you know, your typical executive Rolex climb, little rock face, take a couple pictures, we go have some breakfast, and <laughs> life is going to be good. He puts me on a 5.5 with all the gear and ropes and all that kind of stuff. I couldn't even tie the knots. Um, that's true. What the hell were you thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? Yeah, and you left me there for a while. Well, you know, on purpose. I mean, <laughs> I'm pretty good at sizing people up for this kind of thing, and, and oh, really? we actually had a few different options. Uh, and I remember meeting you, and I talked to my crew, and I was like, "Look, he's going to get bored on anything too easy." So, I mean, he's not the CEO of a $14 billion company because he likes easy. You know, he, he probably wants a, a bit more of a challenge. And honestly, I knew that you wouldn't have an experience, um, the kind of experience I would hope you to have unless you actually really had to commit and try something a little bit above your head. So... Um, we decided to take you there, and, and I figured, you know, you probably have a pretty good insurance uh, package, so <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's take him on, on this wall. <laughs> well, when you, I'll tell you, Jimmy asked me, uh, you know, what were you, what were you thinking? Because there was a situation where I couldn't see him. He had to go around, around a corner. You actually screwed me twice. <laughs> you, you did it in that spot where I couldn't see him. I kind of hang in there, and I watched his movements. And you know when you watch somebody do something and they're excellent at it, you say, that can't be that difficult. And then you realize it's extraordinarily difficult, and that's why he's so good at it. I couldn't, I couldn't do the same movement. And I'm kind of hanging there. And when I got to the top, I said, you know, what were you, what were you, what was I, he asked me what I was thinking about. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to splat on the bottom. It's over for me. <laughs> but for you, you just killed a Fortune 500 CEO. You're finished. <laughs> Completely finished. So I figured that he had a lot more to lose than me on this, and I was, I was going to be okay. And um, that's when I got a little bit more serious of actually taking a little bit more risk because I had to stretch out. And if you've ever done any climbing, it's, uh, it really is your lower body that and I was using way too much upper body. So that was my, uh, my <laughs> moment. And then the other time when you screwed me was we come to the very top and I see a trail that you could just walk up. 
I figure I'm done. I've survived this thing. You know, I'm getting a Coke and a smile. I'm finished. <laughs> no, no, no. We're, we're climbing some more. And it happens to be one of the, you know, to get up over that, that hump. So I enjoyed the experience for sure. Um, Good. But it really reinforced some of the messages that I want to talk to everybody else here about. So let's hit on this theme of uh, creativity and execution. You know, when I saw Maru, I realized what you're doing is, is kind of like what we do, but at a very extreme level. Like, you cannot develop systems um, and you cannot develop new applications without a massive amount of creativity. And if you try to be super creative and just dump that stuff into production, that's when you get the hacks, that's when you get bad customer experience, that's when you get a bad reputation. So you have to get that execution element put together. When you're, when you're doing these climbs, I know you try to figure out the path, but I think you're making real-time decisions. And then from an execution point of view, and, and I, w I was kind of joking about the safety. I got to tell you, Jimmy has a process for safety, and he could have, you know, he could have had anybody climbing with him, and it was going to be the same uh, protocol, like the language that's used. You know, they taught me the language to use and how to get into the harness and, and all that kind of stuff. So it actually was, was quite safe, but there's an execution element to it. So tell us a little bit about how you balance creativity and execution, especially when you're doing some of these ascents. Creativity and execution. I mean, a lot of my, my job is about being creative under duress, under kind of, you know, all these different stresses. Um, but that is, you know, essentially the biggest challenge for me is to kind of manage those two aspects and creativity and execution. Uh, you know, th th you only have a certain amount of bandwidth that you can um, function with. And when you're climbing, uh, you have to spend a lot of that bandwidth on your safety systems, on all the different factors that are potential risks or objective hazards. Um, and then you need to have some bandwidth to be able to, you know, film or shoot uh, or think about how you're going to shoot. And so, you know, it really comes down to a ton of preparation ahead of time and experience so that the climbing aspect becomes second nature and you are able to kind of increase that space to focus on being creative, you know. And, and I've been climbing for a long time. Uh, I know all my systems. They're all very redundant in terms of the safety. And that's how you kind of open up more space to be, be creative. Now, the other thing that I noticed as well, especially for you, is you're really commanding two disciplines at the same time, both very difficult. You're, you're part of a team, and sometimes leading a team, climbing. You're definitely the leader of all the cinematography and the filming. And kind of odd to think about executing in both disciplines. How do you process that, and how did you get good at that? What did, what did it take to make you yeah. world-class in multiple domains that that multitasking is is um, is a huge part of what i do uh there's a couple components to it certainly like i was saying before i mean you really have to master each component of each area like in terms of climbing building all of your foundation uh in a way that you know to become a world-class climber you have to be a master of every single component and when you have that mastery, again, it's like you, you've opened up some space for uh, creativity and for that intersection of creativity and climbing and execution. And that's where the magic kind of happens, right? Um, the other big part is your team. And, you know, there's so much trust that's involved with climbing. You have to know that... Uh, your partner has your back and that they're paying attention to all the potential hazards and they're constantly making evaluations and assessments of the risk and you trust that they're doing that just as well as you and in that way you can really move uh, efficiently, safely 
Um, and there's a certain synergy that happens uh, when you have that level of trust and everybody is doing their job, you know. And uh, at the upper levels of what we're doing when we're in the Himalayas and the, the stakes are extraordinarily high and you've got one chance to get a shot and you've got one chance to climb the mountain, you know, everything has to be executed perfectly. And when that starts to happen, it kind of snowballs and, and you, you build this momentum and you can feel it. Confidence? Yeah, there's confidence. Um, you know, it, but you're still, there's still that kind of situa uh, situational awareness, you know, where, you, where you're still constantly, there's confidence, but there's also a recognition of overconfidence too, where there's that moment where you're like, okay, we're moving really well, things are going great. That's also another time when you kind of have to be really careful. Um, where I'm kind of jumping topics, but that's, that's also something that's so, really important. So when, you know, in 2008, Jimmy first tried to climb Maru. Like, first of all, Maru, the shark's fin's never been climbed before. Multiple, multiple, very experienced climbers have tried before. Um, you and Conrad gave it a shot in um, 08. So how does it feel and how does it happen when you just take a look at the risk profile and just say, we got to stop? I mean, how hard is that discussion? You're with the team. Um, do people have a dissenting view or is it just obvious or okay. how does that go down? So uh, if you haven't seen the film or know much about it, there's this moment on our first attempt where we're literally 300 feet from the summit and we've been climbing for 17 or 18 days on seven days of food and we have been pushing and pushing and every single day we thought, man, I don't know, should we turn around and we would kind of make an assessment and we'd be like, you know what, let's, let's push a little bit further um, and see where we get. And literally that last day we're looking, we can, literally see the summit and and we decide we have to turn around and that comes with again a lot of experience uh, you have to know what risks you're willing to take before you even walk out the door um, on an expedition like this and there's a certain understanding or a discussion that happens before you even leave with your partners you know it's like how far are we willing to push? Everybody knows that, you know, there's a lot of variables and things can change on the climb, but you, you have a pretty solid sense of, like, what the stakes are, what you're willing to do to get to your objective. Uh, the fine line, of course, is that, you know, you, you have to take risks, though, right, in order to progress or to evolve or to get to the summit. But there's a point when you have to cut your losses. And uh, in this situation, we knew that, okay, here are the facts. If we spend the night here without our sleeping bags and our tents, which is what this is gonna require, we're probably all gonna lose fingers and toes, um, or worse. And how important is that objective uh, even though we've pushed this hard, is it worth it? Uh, and it just was clear that it wasn't worth it. So in our industry, we've changed a lot. And, and there's two points I want to bring. One is this notion, and I used it actually in my keynote with, uh, with Yo Piazza, teaching her team you know, to fail fast. In, in our industry, and still to this day, I think there's a, a bit of a, a stigma. If you're, you're working on a project and it doesn't work out, you failed. You know, that, that word failure, you know, it didn't work out. Um, how did you, did you feel like you failed or did you feel like you made the right decision? Like, how, how do, would that be considered a failure or would that be considered, you know, a prudent, smart, experienced decision? Yeah. Well, we always say it was a success if you come home. Um, <laughs> It's kind of a requirement, you know? <laughs> you, you got the round trip ticket, not the one-way ticket. Um, you know, the classic line is the summit is only halfway. But clearly it was the right decision because I'm here. 
uh, with you and with everybody here. It's funny though because the team, I, when you go on an expedition like this, you're with a team that, and, and partners that you really have spent some time with and gotten to know. So it's pretty classic because this isn't the team that says, oh, we failed goes home, tail between the legs, and decides to hang up the harness and climbing shoes and do something else. We were literally, I mean, of course, when we had to make this decision to turn around, I felt like I'd gotten my, the, my heart ripped out of me. I was like, there, I was devastated, absolutely. And we still had to get down the mountain. So you have to stay focused. You can't just let By it. By the way, that's the other thing that sucks about what you do. You, you climb <laughs> all the way to the top, and I mean, I'd be there, you know, like, pop the champagne, I want a helicopter, pick me up, I'm done. But hey. then, you got to come all the way down. Yeah, well, What's I want to climb with you, because <laughs> I want to take the helicopter down. Um, but yeah, so we still have to go down, and like I was talking about Conrad, it's so funny, because about, I don't know, three, four hours later, we're still trying to get off the mountain. And Conrad looks at me and he's like, you know, next time we got to bring lighter crampons. And we need to make the hall bags lighter. And we got to, and, and I remember looking at him being like, are you freaking kidding me? And he's like, yeah, our sleeping bags weren't warm enough. But, you know, if we save weight on the crampons and the hall bags, we can bring warmer sleeping bags, which would have made us much more efficient towards the top of the climb. And I was just laughing. I was just like, this guy. But that's the kind of people you want on your team, you know? And it wasn't thinking about, do, you know, we just had the most epic failure of all time. All he was thinking about was, man, next time, how are we gonna do this better? And I, sh I'm, I wasn't actually surprised at that moment because I've been climbing on expeditions with Conrad for over 20, well, let's say 15 years now, 16 years. Um, but that's what I appreciate about a good partner. That's why every time he wants to go on a ridiculous trip that seems completely outrageous and impossible, I always sign up because I'm like, okay, well, this is going to be fun. Uh, I get to lose 20 pounds. I get to starve. I get to freeze my ass off. This is going to be great. You know, J Jimmy's wife was talking about him, you know, what's it like when Jimmy comes home? He says it's a week of eating. Absolute eating. I actually had dinner with Jimmy last night. The dude can chow down like a champion. <laughs> he, uh, I took him out for a nice dinner because uh, I know he's going, he's leaving to Antarctica in two days with Conrad and with uh, Alex Arnold. And I figured this is going to be, uh, it sounds a little morbid now that I'm saying not your last meal. I hope it's not your yeah. last meal. I but, act like they're all yeah, my last it was, meals. It though. was going to be, uh, it was going to be your last, you know, hot, you know, meal that's yeah. been prepared for you, because I know you got some exciting sludge and shakes to, to eat and yeah. enjoy. Well, the next thing I want to talk about, another thing that's kind of changing in our industry, is all of you will remember this, especially if you come from my generation of development. And I, I used to say that where I was always the youngest guy in the room, I am no longer the youngest guy in the room. But our generation, we used to celebrate the hero, the person that would, you know, sit in a room, eat pizza, drink cola, come up with the algorithm, come up with the, you know, the interesting approach to a technical problem. And we celebrated those people for years and years and years and years. You know, fast forward to the consumer age uh, and the speed in which it requires for us to get interesting technology into production, you know, there is no hero anymore. It is about heroic teams, you know, the collaboration. This is something that is, you know, in all honesty for, for us, it's, it's our industry, it's only like 10 or 15 years old. It seems to me when I was understanding what it is you do and the collaboration that's required, it, it seems more natural. Is it just a function of what it is you do or is it the leadership that you have and Conrad and, and, the, and the people that celebrate your craft? Because it is becoming more and more important. If you take a look at the things that really work out in our industry, it's really about the teams, not about the individual anymore. And it seems like in climbing, it, it's always been about collaboration. Yeah, it, well, absolutely. It's about collaboration. It's about 
trust. Uh, and when I talk about trust, it's not just about their technical capacity to climb, but trust that they're going to make, your partner's going to make good decisions, that they're not going to let their egos get in the way of safety or that, you know, they're going to be too brash um, in certain ways. So uh, it's always about collaboration. In terms of this next layer of filming and shooting with athletes in these environments, it adds like a whole other layer because, you know, you're coordinating with the athletes and they have to trust that you're going to get the shot because what they're doing is extraordinarily dangerous or they're only going to be able to do it once um, and it's never been done before. Uh, there's a lot of all these different levels of collaboration that are creative and physical and mental and um, it's like a web that uh, makes it interesting for me and, and that's why I love doing what I do. We talked a little bit about fear of failure. Um, there's a 60 minute uh, segment that has Alex Hornold where he's talking about his free climb and Jimmy's project that he's, he's doing right now, the movie will be out? Uh, probably this summer. Summer. Um, and this is Jimmy in a crazy moral predicament of his, you know, one of his best friends wants to free climb El Capitan and he wants Jimmy to film him. You know, what do you do? Like, I mean, this is going to be a humongous hit. Um, but if it doesn't work out, I mean, I just participated in one of my best friends, you know, not, not getting to where he wanted to be. So the 60-minute segment really talks about Alex as an individual and his ability to compartmentalize fear. Now, you must have a way of doing that as well. Walk us a little through Alex as an individual and his ability to be a, a, a very free thinker and compartmentalized mental discipline to do what he does, how that compares to how you think about it, and a little bit of the behind baseball of, of, of how you came to the decision that this is a project that you thought you were going to be comfortable doing. Right. Uh, I'll tackle the first question first. So that was kind of our dinner conversation last night, but uh, that was a very challenging decision because of a lot of reasons. Uh, the first place that my mind went to when essentially we had a studio say, hey, we're going to finance that film if you want to make it, uh, was the image of my good friend falling in front of me and I just didn't know if that was ethically like a film that I, I wanted to make um, this, but I went to talk to a couple of my mentors about it uh, my good friend John Krakauer uh, he's you probably know him as the author he he said look he's gonna do this with or without you uh, and if anybody's going to tell that story in the right way, because most people think he's just insane, and that's not actually the case. And I can talk a little bit about that when we talk about the fear aspect of it. But, and he said, you know, you're going to be the right person to um, tell that story in the right way because you understand what's, what's happening um, and what he's going through. Uh, and then he said... <laughs> And I'd watched the movie, <laughs> so that was, the his, endorsement? He, that was kind of his endorsement. Um, but I was, I was definitely conflicted about it. Uh, but the bet that I made in my mind was not that, oh, Alex is going to be able to do this. The bet I made was that Alex will make the right decision. He's not going to do it unless he's ready to do it. Because that's the kind of person Alex is. So there's the type of people in my industry and probably everybody's industry where um, they aim really high, they don't necessarily have the experience or knowledge or, or discipline to, to make something happen. Um, they go for it and it's almost like a bit more of a stunt. And then you've got people who, you know, set their sights really high, um, but they're willing to do the work to get there. And they aren't willing to skip any steps, A, because they appreciate the process, um, and B, because that's not how you do things well, and they know that. So when I'm transitioning into the, the talking about fear, 
So everybody thinks that Alex, you know, we went in and got this test. We had an MRI and, you know, they looked at his amygdala, which is the part of the brain that manages kind of the fear response. And uh, the doctors looked at it and they said, yeah, you know, your amygdala, the way it fires does not fire in the same way that normal people, normal people's brains fire. Um, but we're not sure if it was a modification because you constantly are in risky situations so that you've kind of acclimated your brain not to react or if you were born that way. Uh, but it's really hard to say if that's how you are able to do what you do, which when I say do what you are able to do, I mean holding on to holds that are half your finger pad and your feet are on literally dime-sized edges, like this, you know, not a dime laying down, but the edge of a dime, 2,000 feet off the ground, and being able to control your breathing and execute at a world-class level in climbing. That's what I'm talking about when I say doing what you're doing. Um, but his process is that he isn't just overcoming his fear or suppressing it. He has gone up and trained on this route and done the moves and has literally figured out and can memorize every single move. And so it's not like he suppresses the fear. He's just expanding his comfort zone slowly and gradually until being in that position isn't scary to him. That's how he did it. Well, that's a, what a great lesson for, for all of us to think about pushing a little bit further and not skipping any of these steps along the way. That's a, that's a very thoughtful, very thoughtful answer to a very complex um, dilemma. So I'm going to hit you with a couple easier ones. Okay, geez. Easy for me to ask. <laughs> There's a, one of the things, that if, if, you, if you go out there, Jimmy's sponsored by uh, North Face, and they do a bunch of promo little vignettes. And uh, there's one I came across a while ago, and it, it really resonated to me how much you have to suffer for your art. You know, sleeping, you know, off the side of a cliff, um, being away from home, you have two young children. Yep. Um, he's heading off to Antarctica in two days with uh, Conrad, and you're going to be gone for six weeks. Um, many of you have to suffer for our craft, travel, deadlines, releases, all of the above. How do you, how do you get yourself into the right frame of mind that this is, this is the life you want and, and, and you can be happy knowing that you're, you might miss out on some other things. How do, you, how do you get your head around that? That's the easy question. I told you, it's easy for you to ask. <laughs> people want to people understand how you, know, how, you, how you sacrifice comfort yeah. and go into these situations knowing that uh, you have all these other responsibilities. You've got a, a company you run. You've got a you know, wife, children. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you manage all that? That's the ongoing question in my life. Uh, but, I mean, I think everybody here can relate to the fact that, you know, life starts to move pretty quickly as you start to get older and you really have to prioritize the things that allow you to be the best person that you can be, to be the most productive person that you can be, to be the best parent that you can be. Uh, and, you know, it's, I'm often conflicted about it because it feels like, you know, me pursuing what I love is really selfish in a lot of levels. Um, and I had to come to terms with the fact that, you know, when I, when I don't do it and, and I'm not in that kind of space that I need to be in, I'm not inspired in my life and I'm not inspired in my daily kind of practice and I don't feel like I'm the best person that I can be, which makes me not that productive. Uh, so I, I have to make that calculation and decide, hey, you know, um, there are costs to me doing this. And a lot of it's a grind. I mean, it looks amazing and like, you know, spectacular and heroic, but, you know, a lot of the work that we do, especially on climbing mountains, you're, you're grinding it out. It's not that 
fun in the moment. We call it type two fun. It's a lot more fun after we're done. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I came to recognize that in order for me to be productive and for me to be a good parent, um, I kind of have to live the life on my terms and, and do these things that inspire me. Oh, great. Got a, another one that might be a little bit more difficult. <clears throat> Once again, taking a look at our industry and, and Jimmy's industry, I expected to find a similarity, and what I found is not a similarity. We all know that we have a gender issue and an inclusion issue in our industry. You know, the number of minorities that come into engineering or even get graduate with STEM degrees, uh, not a lot of gender diversity in our industry. About 24% of all of our workforce is female, and yet, you know, the population's almost 50-50. I was expecting when I went and looked at how things work in adventure sports that I would find something similar, and, and what I found is not true at all. There are just as many world-class female adventure athletes as there are men. Um, one you've, you've spent time with, Steph Davis, uh, Lynn Hill, uh, Margot Hayes. What, what do you guys do in the adventure world that is more inclusive? And maybe we could learn a little something about that um, in the tech world. Well, I'd say that uh, actually the, the, this whole genre in the, in, in the adventure world has changed pretty dramatically in the last 10 years. Because when I first started, I felt like there was a huge gender gap. And now I go to Yosemite where, you know, 20 years ago, it was the dude fest of dude fests, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was... And now I go out there and... Is that where you learn brobonics? Yes. I teach brobonics, actually, if you need to... It's a whole language. <laughs> actually, my kids speak it. Like, gross actually means good. Um, sick. Sick, is, is, sick totally. is completely not sick. Sick is super rad. And then you have to look up what super rad means. But Jimmy's got this all, all nailed. I know. I've been trying to translate into normal talk this whole time. But... Uh, I think that one of the big things that happened in our industry was that there were some incredible women that had these breakthrough moments uh, in, in climbing. There's Lynn Hill, which you mentioned previously. She was the first person to free climb the nose. Uh, it doesn't mean she climbed without ropes. She climbed it with ropes, but she didn't aid climb. I don't get in the technicalities of it, but the point being that she did something that no guy could do and that no guy could repeat even 10, 15, 20 years later. And I just feel like there have been some incredible role models in, in our industry that I think really opened up um, people's eyes. And, and I don't just mean for young women or girls who, you know, needed a, a good female role model, but like it, it kind of shifted everything for the guys too, where it was like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, like I see it a little bit differently now. You take, uh, ladies on these big excursions with you and make them part of your team? You mean, do some ladies bring me on yeah. some of their excursions? Better, better question. <laughs> I mean, when I went to ski Everest, I had a goal of skiing Everest for many years. But at the end of the day, when I actually did it, I wasn't the expedition leader. It was Kit Delore, my good friend, and she's the two-time women's free skiing world champion. Um, she was the first woman to ski the Seven Summits. She invited me on her trip, uh, so just to make that point. Uh, no, I'm leaving in two days on an expedition to Antarctica with Alex and Conrad, but I'm also with two other really extraordinarily strong climbing uh, partners, Savannah Cummings and Anna Pfaff. And, uh, and so it's, you know, it's a good mix. I think that that adds a lot, just that perspective. Um, coming from women is, is... Well, we're working at it, but we, uh, we've got a ways, ways to go. Maybe, yeah. uh, maybe taking a, a harder look at the volume of material on climbing, which 
You guys like to write, let me tell you. A Google search on climbing, you can be buried for weeks. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I'm going to end this with, uh, with a, a quick video clip that I find incredibly inspirational. And what I want you to do, Jimmy, to end it for, for all of us here and give us a, the right liftoff for CA World is tell us how you felt. Like, I mean, right down to the core when you see the end of this clip. Can we play the clip? I was like, Jimmy, this is your lead. It's your turn to take the reins. Absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, what a moment. Uh, well, I would say, I mean, it kind of says it all. That's how I felt. Um, you know, there's few moments in life when you can feel that sense of deep satisfaction, and that sense of satisfaction certainly doesn't come easily because it's probably directly proportional with how difficult the challenge was. I think everybody understands that. Uh, but interestingly, what I was actually thinking was like, now we have to get off of this thing. <laughs> And in a lot of ways, it's kind of analogous to, to life in general. It's never over, you know? Like, you can have these great successes, but, like, there's always still more to do. And uh, until we got home, that trip wasn't, wasn't finished. So uh, you, you can celebrate these moments of success, but, you know, there's always kind of more to do. Well, I'll tell you what, Jimmy. You've been very gracious with your time. It's been great to get to yeah. know you. We are all looking forward to seeing this movie in the summer, and I think we all should give him a big round of applause and wish him well out in Antarctica. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That, that was awesome. awesome. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.